This is a Volkswagen Audi 1.8 turbo engine. Um, this is the AEB, at least it's supposed to be, engine uh, that would be out of like a 98, 99, maybe 2000 Passat or Audi A4. This, this particular one I think was a, a 98 Audi A4 that this engine was out of. It's out with the wiring harness and everything. I'm gonna take this engine all apart, go through it, and do a few enhancements, and then do an engine conversion, uh, an engine swap into a uh, Porsche 944. So I thought I would just do a little kind of um, explanation of what's what from, from what I see. So this is the, the front of the engine. Uh, it's, a, it's a little bit angled compared to what it would be in the car. You've got your turbocharger here, your wastegate actuator there. Of course, your timing belt. Timing belt drives the exhaust cam, which must have a, a chain drive internally to the intake cam, which is here. This little module is your cam position sensor. It looks like uh, there's a, a tensioner here, hydraulic tensioner for the, the timing belt and uh, just a spring tensioner on your accessory drive belt and it actually looks like there's no no tensioner on the, I think that's the water pump drive belt there that's being driven from the power steering pump. So you've got the power steering pump here, water pump in the middle, alternator up here, and then it's uh, also driving the fan. The fan blade has been removed, but this is the viscous fan clutch for the radiator fan. At the very top, you have your four coil packs for each spark plug. That's what fires the spark plugs. This stainless steel tube is your fuel rail, which has fuel injectors, four fuel injectors coming off, going into each runner of the intake manifold. The intake manifold here goes to the, the throttle body. So I know that one of the differences between the earlier uh, cars versus the later 1.4 turbos is this is a, a cable actuated throttle that would have a cable connected to this ball to, to pull that as opposed to an e-throttle which would be um, actuated by the computer and there would be no physical link with the, the gas pedal. This is a, a coolant hose. At the back of the head, we have the, the coolant where it comes off to uh, a temperature sensor in the car. These are a, a pain to change because they're in the back. This goes to your heater core. This comes back from your heater core. Uh, this is a cooler for the oil filter. The oil filter housing is here. And these are your coolant lines. So it, it both will help warm up the coolant faster um, from the warm oil, and then it will help the, or prevent the oil from exceeding too high a temperature. We've got where the dipstick goes into the block. We've got the, uh, again, coming off the water pump here, that coolant line. There's a nice grimy sensor here. That's your crank position sensor. You've got your wiring to the back of the alternator. Under here against the block, there's a, a knock sensor. Let's see if I can get a better view of that and focus. Yeah, there's the knock sensor in the center of the frame. Here's a better view of that uh, crank position sensor. There's a braided stainless steel line that comes off of the oil filter mount the oil filter housing which then goes behind the head here this metal line which then goes into the turbocharger so this is the oil feed for the turbocharger and then the oil drains back out returns to the uh, crankcase on this line down here back into the oil pan and then the other feed from the turbocharger this other line uh, is connected to the to the coolant system the water system Here's that feed line, the coolant feed line, and then the return for that is this rubber hose here that then goes back 
into the into the block. So that's your coolant for the turbocharger. Your wastegate diaphragm. Um, there's a, a diaphragm in here which is actuated by vacuum. The wastegate diaphragm actuates a little valve in here to vent the extra exhaust pressure away from the turbine. So here's the exhaust header. So the hot exhaust gases come through the header to the turbocharger and spin the turbocharger to build boost. If, the, if it's built enough boost or the computer wants to reduce the boost, it will open the wastegate, which will vent the exhaust gases from the manifold right into the stream out of the turbocharger, thus reducing the spinning of the turbocharger to reduce boost. And as the turbocharger spins, this is the inlet vein. So as that spins, it sucks air through the middle and kind of throws, you know, comp compresses the air and sends the air out here at, at a higher pressure. From here, it, it goes into an intercooler, and then from the intercooler comes over to the, the throttle body on the intake system. So the first step for today is I'm going to remove all of the wiring, remove the wiring harness. So all of the, all of the clips and plugs and sensors are all coming off. Now that I removed the wiring harness, I actually found a few things that I had missed before. So I had pointed out the one knock sensor that was there. There was a second knock sensor right there on that little, uh, that little metal boss on the block there behind the the oil filter console. And then on the oil filter console itself, there's a pressure sense sending unit, and there is also a temperature sending unit right there. So there's two wires going there I didn't mention before. You can see where the, uh, the angle, po the crank position sensor reads the teeth on the gear in there. Uh, everything else is relatively straight forward removing the wiring harness. I removed the coil packs too while I'm at it. So now you can see the spark plugs and the spark plug holes. So now I'm going to take off all of the coolant lines, all the coolant hoses. So, uh, and this is a vacuum hose. So I'm gonna take off coolant and vacuum hoses as the next step. Coolant hoses are all off. It's interesting to point out how much corrosion there is in some of these. I don't know if you can see all that kind of white powdery crap. So, uh, yeah. So there was certainly some part of the cooling system that wasn't being that efficient. However, looking into the head port, it doesn't look too bad in there. And there's certainly some corrosion, but it's not as bad as I was expecting in there. Uh, there was also a little vacuum line from this nipple to over here, this is the fuel pressure regulator. So in the fuel rail, the threaded fitting is the high pressure fitting, so that goes from the fuel pump. So the fuel pump pressurizes the fuel rail for all of the injectors you know, to squirt the fuel out. And then the excess fuel um, goes past a little diaphragm and a spring here through this, this curved hose, which comes to the barbed fitting, so the barb fitting is low pressure, so that's why it's not a threaded fitting like this one. So the low pressure returns to the tank, so there's always this circulation of fuel. At idle, when the throttle body closes, there's extra va or there's a lot of vacuum, a lot of suction, a lot of negative pressure in the intake manifold as the pistons are trying to suck air, the throttle body is closed, so the, um, when the throttle body is closed, no air can go in, so you have you know, a partial vacuum or more of a partial vacuum than usual in the manifold at idle. And so that then opens up this little diaphragm so that it reduces the pressure in the fuel rail because at idle it doesn't need to consume as much fuel. And then once you start uh, opening the throttle body to accelerate and as you get boost pressure uh, and you start getting positive pressure in here, this uh, diaphragm closes up so that um, you have the maximum pressure in the fuel rail for your maximum fuel delivery. For my next step, I'm going to take off the fuel rail, and I'm also going to take off the oil feed to the turbo. Now with the fuel rail off, I'm going to take the intake manifold off next. 
Now I'm going to take off the oil filter console with that cooler. And there's three bolts. One's way tucked right under here, which I don't have a straight shot with uh, my socket, my Allen socket. So to get that, I'm going to undo this nut on the cooler. I'll put to take this housing off, and then I'll be able to take the whole thing off. Now I'm going to take off the accessory belt. And then I'm going to remove this whole kind of console, which has the alternator the power steering and the, the idler for the fan. I think the water pump may not come off yet, but we shall see. So here's my answer. That console has bolts that go through here, here, and here which then uh, hold down the water pump. So now the water pump is just free to, to lift up. Oh, great, and it's uh, still got water in it spilling out. Delightful. All right, let's take the valve cover off now. Let's see what 20 valves looks like. Because again, this is a, we've got five valves per cylinder, three intake and two exhaust. All right, so we have uh, both camshafts, exhaust camshaft and intake camshaft. Again, the exhaust is run off of the timing belt, and then there's a chain drive with a hydraulic tensioner here to, uh, to take up the slack for the, the intake cam. These are the cam bridges or bearing bridges or what holds the, the cam in place, and they're all numbered. Um, well, the number one one isn't, but then it goes two, three, four, five, and the same two, three, four, five, so you can put them back in the same orientation. These front ones have little arrows, little triangles that are pointing towards the gears so that you don't confuse them and get them in the wrong place. So as long as you get these in place with the arrows pointing to the gears and then you count up two through five, you're going to get everything in the right place and you've got this uh, back kind of brace or strap that then goes over the, the back side. When the engine's turning, you can see how the, the cams turn and the, the chains turn. And you can also see there's this little um, sheet metal wheel with a notch on it on the intake cam. That's where your cam position sensor goes. So when it sees the break in the metal wall, it knows that it's at a specific spot in the cycle of the cam, which isn't exactly the TDC spot. Or actually, maybe it is. So right, right here is about where the engine's at TDC. So that's actually right. So that little sensor, I think where I think it looks. Well, let's look where it looks. That sensor actually has its uh, its little sensor here for the the break in the middle, uh, kind of right at the top. So when this is in place at TDC, it, it sees the little window. So that's how it, uh, using this and along with the, the cam, using the cam sensor along with the crankshaft sensor, the engine knows where TDC is and it also knows the RPMs of the engine. Because there's three valves per cylinder, you can see that there's three lobes for each cylinder for the intake cam. And that's why this little bridge has that little opening for that third lobe, where the exhaust is only operating two valves. And so you get the uh, just the two lobes here. All right, now I'm going to take off the turbocharger and then the exhaust manifold. I'm going to start by, there's a, a bracket here that goes all the way to the block that supports it. And then there's the oil return feed that goes to the oil pan. The water I have already, the water return hose I have already taken off. And then I'm going to undo the remaining two bolts on the manifold. Uh, someone has already undone the third. Perhaps it's broken. Who knows why it wasn't replaced? Uh, there's a bunch of stuff I found, right? There's a broken exhaust stud. There's uh, one of the, the crank pulley bolts is missing. There's a bunch of missing bolts kind of throughout this engine. Uh, some stuff has been done on it, and, you know, whatever mechanic attacked it first just didn't put stuff back together. 
So this is pretty funny. I didn't realize it uh, when the turbo was still on, but the light that you see through there, you're not supposed to see. So the way this is, remember I said the, the wastegate, you've got this actuator on the side. That's this one here. So it moves this rod, which moves this little, this little crank, this little lever, like that. And what's supposed to happen is on this little tab here with that hole, there's supposed to be a metal disc uh, that is like a valve that seals on that that little valve seat in there so that when this opens up What it does is it raises that little that little valve off the seat to, to let that exhaust pressure Bypass the turbo so it doesn't spin the uh, the hot side of the turbo so you can get that light back in there You can see the uh, the impeller there on the hot side so this car probably was performing pretty miserably because it wasn't making full boost. Not only that, those last uh, two bolts on the intake manifold were, uh, were pretty loose, so there was probably a bit of an exhaust leak around that, that, that exhaust manifold in the, uh, in the turbo to begin with. And I don't know, did someone try to start taking this apart and realize what was wrong or not? Unknown. So that's... Uh, that's a little bit of a, of a curious event. So the next step is I'm going to take that manifold off, and then I'm going to take this heat shield off, and then I'm going to take the engine mount and this console for the air conditioning off, and then this whole side of the engine will be pretty stripped. All right, the engine is naked on the exhaust side. And it is naked on the intake side, minus the dipstick, which the dipstick tube, I think, is just um, like a press fit into the block. So I don't think there's an easy way to remove that. I also have not removed whatever this plug cover is. Like on ye old timey engines, that would have been for a distributor drive or something. But this, I haven't taken that off yet, so I don't know what that is. But what I'm going to do next is take off the rest of the timing belt cover and let's have a look at that timing belt system. So the cover came off real easy. Just, uh, just the bolts that were holding the pulley to this gear and then the, a few bolts on the plastic cover. So now we can kind of see what happens you know, as the, the crankshaft spins. It drives this gear, which uh, you've got the tensioner mechanism here. You've got the camshaft gear, and then on the return, it goes to the oil pump drive. So there's a long shaft that goes right along the side of the engine here to the rear where the oil pump is. So, and I guess it really goes the other way, right? Because it's pulling, because it's under tension. So the tensioner takes up on the slack side of the belt, and the tension side of the belt goes from the crank to the oil pump drive to the camshaft up here. And it spins like that. So when I first had taken, or when I first saw the tensioner, I thought this was a hydraulic tensioner because this looks very similar to like a little uh, a cylinder, like a little um, fluid-filled hydraulic cylinder, which some engines have where it uses oil pressure from the oiling system to uh, extend a little cylinder so that it puts the right tension on. However, I had just taken this off, and I'll take it off again. loosen it up and you kind of swing out of the way so this tensioner there's a little spot here under this uh, little arm so because the center of this is offset as you turn it it will uh, take up the slack on the belt or not so I had assumed that this little tensioner was hydraulic but there's no um, there's no oil feeds or anything through the block so it's not hydraulic um, so then I'm like, oh, well maybe it's a spring loaded with the spring in there. But as I'm looking at it and studying, there's a, a circlip and then a seal, an oil seal. And I tried pressing this with um, even just by hand or uh, even in a vise, like there's a lot of resistance, almost like there's some sort of fluid in there. So I think it's some sort of fluid filled thing that it must expand a little bit as temperature changes um, to, to put the right tension on the belt. Anyhow, so the idler uh, is, is connected to this, so it's only the two bolts that hold it on, and then you know, there's 
is the actual tensioner. So I imagine when you do a timing belt kit, you, I don't know if you get a new tensioner or not, but um, this tensioner seems much cleaner than a lot of the other stuff on the engine. So presumably, uh, when you do the timing belt, you do change the tensioner. Now that the tensioner is off and there's slack on the belt, we can now pull the belt off of the pulley. And at this point, because the camshaft is now no longer connected to the crank, I'm not going to turn the crank or the cam over anymore until the, the, at, until the head's off so that I don't accidentally have a collision between the valves and the, the piston. But our oil pump drive gear, we can still turn that. So that's how that turns. So the next thing I'm going to take off is another more, one more little cover. I'm going to take off this idler and I'm going to take off the engine mount on the front. So I took off the little hold down bracket for this and I was able to, with a screwdriver and a hammer, kind of tap on alternating sides and drive up this little aluminum cap. And inside is a gear that is for your oil pump. That's the oil pump. And so when you turn the oil pump drive, or when it's turned by the timing belt, I don't know if you can see the shaft is rotating inside the block and then it's turning that gear. And using a magnet, kind of while, while I'm turning it, I should be able to lift this gear up. Well, it happened a, happened a moment ago. There we go. So I can pull that drive gear out so it won't fall out later. So that's your oil pump drive gear. And it's got a, a splined, for a splined shaft, and then it's got the gear teeth that run off this intermediate shaft. Here's that oil pump intermediate shaft. So I take the gear off. There's a little cover with an oil seal and two bolts. And once I had that off, I was able to just slide that intermediate shaft right out of the hole in the block there. So that was pretty, pretty straightforward. Next step is removing the camshafts. There's a, I've already pointed out the, the bearing bridges, how they're numbered and all of that. Another thing I want to point out is that the orientation of the cams is somewhat important. Um, if you look on the exhaust cam here, you see a keyway. That keyway is pointing straight up, straight up relative to the engine, not necessarily for the car, uh, when it's in the car. Uh, so again, that's, this is at TDC, top dead center. And if you look, you can just see, hmm, maybe I need a light to, to get down in there. A little bit of light, you can see the cam, the keyway on the intake camshaft. I think hopefully you can see that as well. So again, that keyway is also pointed straight up. So those keyways are pointed straight up when both cams are at top dead center. That is how we are going to, you know, get our spacing right on the, uh, on the timing chain. And another way you can tell is, so again, we're at the backside of the engine here, but another way typically on dual overhead cam engines, the lobes, these lobes here um, for cylinder number one, the exhaust lobe on this side and the intake lobe on that side are kind of pointed at each other in a relatively symmetric way when that's at top dead center. So all the other lobes are kind of in much more random positions to each other, but this, you know, take note of these front lobes uh, kind of, you know, upward angled at each other. That's kind of a standard thing, again, for, uh, for dual overhead cam engines. Uh, and sometimes an engine manufacturer will actually have a spec, you know, you can use a caliper and it'll say, you know, it's 117 millimeters or something like that. So you know that you have that, that cam spacing right, that indexing right for the chain. But again, as long as we go by those keyways, I think we're going to be okay. So I'm going to break all of these bolts loose, just break them loose, and then I'm going to unscrew them kind of um, intermittently so that I'm not, because the lifters are going to be pushing up from the valve springs on the cam, and I don't want to have uh, you know too much load pushing up unbalanced on the on the camshaft. So once I break them all, I'll start loosening them up so that I can take the, the camshaft out all at once as opposed to just taking one off and then the next off and the next and the next. 
camshafts are out, I did have to take the gear off of the exhaust cam, the timing gear off the exhaust cam to, to lift it up. There was a little boss on the head that prevented it from lifting up, so I had to take that off to then get it out. But I want to point out that on the intake cam, the one that has the, the three lobes per cylinder, the middle lobe of each three set is a little offset. So the timing of one valve is a little different from the other two valves, which I, is interesting. I think it gives it also a longer overlap because, or longer intake overlap, because when this is going to be rotating this direction, when these two lobes uh, start, you know, letting a valve close, this one is still holding it at, um, at full open for a little bit. So it's probably a little trick that they can do to increase the uh, the duration the intake open duration uh, with that lobe profile and and or so as being the middle one i don't know if that middle valve looking on the intake side that middle valve being a kind of the closest one to the intake runner maybe that's the one that is more likely to have a little bit of air go in there during your valve overlap so during valve overlap during valve overlap, you have an exhaust valve that's open at the same time that an intake valve is open. So as the last little bit of expanding exhaust gases are rushing out of the cylinder on this side, if you open the intake valve while all that, you know, that those gases are rushing out, it actually creates a little bit of suction on the intake side, and it will help draw in fresh air to kind of fill that voided space while the exhaust is rushing out before the exhaust valve closes. So valve overlap is a technique to get a little bit of extra air into the cylinder based on that, that scavenging effect. Now I'm ready to pull the lifters out. Uh, there are these cute little lifters on the intake side and kind of bigger ones on the exhaust side. And one thing I like to do for lifters to keep them um, uh, identified in their position so I can put them back in the head in the same spot is to use an egg carton where I can uh, you know, put my... So I'm going to start counting from the, the cam chain side of the camshaft. And this is my intake one, so it's going to go from, from 1 to 12. And then for the exhaust side, I've got another egg carton. Now it's time to take the head off. There are 10 bolts. You do need a special tool, which I had to order. It's uh, an M10S, and it's got like a... a a little bit like a Torx look to it, but it's more square on the on the little the little ribs. So it's a special tool, but this one fits nicely. So I'm gonna undo the head, starting with the the outer the outer bolts, and work my way to the center. So the opposite, uh, you you undo a head the opposite of the Torx sequence for tightening. Here's the head removed. You can see the five valves per cylinder very well here. The three intake ones on this side, which are a little smaller in diameter. And you can see how one of them is real, you know, close to the edge of the bore. And, but that really gives you, you know, good airflow to, to fill that chamber with air. And overall, it looks, it looks pretty clean. You know, there's a little bit of carbon buildup, probably the most on cylinder number four here. Um, but in general, it looks, it looks pretty clean, so I'm, I'm pretty, pretty pleased. I don't know if this block has been opened up before. I do see some copper uh, head gasket sealant on here, uh, which I was a little surprised to see. I don't know if that means that it has had the head off or not. Um, but the, the bores look pretty clean. There's still cross-hatching evidence on uh, the, the cylinder walls. I'll probably still send the block out to a, to a shop to, to have it evaluated, but it's good to see that there's no major scoring or anything. Everything is moving pretty freely. You can see that cylinders one and four go up and down at the same time, and two and three go down up and down at the same time. But overall, I'm, uh, I'm pretty pleased with the, the insight of how this engine works. So now it's time to turn it upside down and remove the oil pan. Here's the underside with the oil pan, and it looks like there's just a series of bolts around the perimeters. Looks like uh, M6 bolts with a 5mm Allen head, and then some larger uh, M10s with 17mm head 
and a hex head at the back. So I'm just going to undo all of those and lift this oil pan off. Inside of the oil pan is less scummy than I imagined. I mean, there's, you know, some oil scum on the bottom, but really not too bad. And then here's the bottom end of the engine. We've got the, the oil pump right here with the pickup towards the front at the deepest part of the, the sump. A plastic windage tray, which seems like it's partially held in by the oil pump. So I'm going to undo the two bolts on the oil pump and uh, take the oil pump off and then take this windage tray out. With the oil pump and windage tray removed, you can see the whole bottom end here as it spins. So I'm going to undo the connecting rod end caps and carefully just push the, the piston down out of the bores. With all of the pistons removed, if you look inside of a bore, the bottom, you can see a, a little squirter nipple there. And so that's your, your piston squirter. Uh, it's out of focus. And there, it, there it goes. So that just, that's an oil squirter or sprayer, just sprays oil on the bottom side of the piston. It not only lubricates the wrist pin, but it also will help spray down the cylinder walls so that they have lubrication. And then the, the lowest ring, the oil scraper ring, its job is to squeegee that oil off. So here's a piston here. This is the piston from the number one bore. And so again, you can see the different rings on there. So the top two rings are called compression rings. Those are what seal up the combustion chamber to keep as much of the combustion gases as possible up in the, in the chamber part although some does seep by, and then the third ring, the bottom ring, is the oil scraper, which is the squeegee. So you see here there's some wear on the piston skirt from rubbing against the side of the wall, and that's somewhat common. And that's on both sides. If you look at the top of the piston, there's a little notch on one side, and that's for clearance for that third or that middle intake valve. There is a, I don't know if the camera picks it up, there's a little stamped in arrow uh, on the piston that points towards the front or to the, uh, the, the timing belt side of the, of the engine for the crankshaft. Another thing we're looking for is scratches and scoring on this top part of the piston between the top compression ring and the top. And then this, uh, this bearing has already come out of the, of the connecting rod, which of course connecting rods are match numbered with each other and their caps. So I always keep the, the caps and the rods. Well, they have to go together as a matched set, and, uh, but I keep them together anyways, just so I don't forget what's what. This one still has the bearing in place, which the bearing does show somewhere, but overall it's, uh, it's pretty good. So I, I've seen a lot worse. So here's the underside. We have everything free. Crankshaft spins nicely. You can see that um, the tooth gear on the back, which the crankshaft position sensor sees. So it counts the teeth to no RPM. And every time it gets to this gap here where there's a tooth missing, it's called a skip tooth pattern. Uh, it knows that it's at top dead center. So the last step to take this engine apart is we're going to undo our five bearing caps on the on the bottom here, and then we're going to undo this end plate on the, the rear side. And there's a kind of a matching end plate on the, the front side. And then we'll, we'll take this front sprocket off, and we'll be able to take that front plate off, and then that crankshaft will lift right out. I've taken off the main bearing cap bolts. And before I remove the main bearing caps and take the crankshaft off, I want to point out that each cap is numbered. So there's number one, two, three, four, and five. And I am on the non-dipstick side of the, of the block here looking at it, and I can read the numbers upright. So it's going to be important when this goes back together to make sure that all those caps are in that same orientation. So here's everything apart. We've got the crankshaft out. We've got all the bearing caps out. 
the uh, I left one oil squirter in so you could see what it looks like there from the back side. All the oil squirters are out. I was able to, with a punch through the hole here, uh, hammer out the dipstick tube. That's the dipstick tube there. So we've got our our bottom end. We have our our pistons and connecting rods and oil pump. We have a bunch of gaskets and valve cover on the bottom there. We have our valve train, our, our lifters and our cams and our uh, chain and tensioner and everything on this cart. And at the bottom here, we've got our windage tray and throttle body and intake manifold and pulleys and assorted hoses. And uh, over here, we've got the head, an exhaust manifold, accessory bracket, alternator and wiring harness and the turbo is uh, I don't know sitting over on a stool so there there you have it there's a uh, pretty much a uh, Volkswagen Audi 1.8 turbo engine in its entirety in parts and uh, exactly how many parts I don't know I probably guess in the 400 range if you count all the fasteners 300 range something like that now we got to Send it off, send parts off to the machine shop and then put it all back together.